Good morning. Thank you for joining us for our newly launched series, MSM Perspectives. My name is Joyce Griggs, and I'm the Executive Vice President and Provost of the Manhattan School of Music. Today, for our first session in this new series, we will explore the artist role in social change. And I am delighted to be joined by my faculty colleagues, Liza Gennaro, a choreographer and our Associate Dean and Director of Musical Theater, Kelly Hall Tompkins, a member of our violin faculty and performing artist, composer and performer Damian Sneed, a member of our Jazz Arts Department, and lastly, MSM alum, countertenor, Anthony Roth Costanzo, who also recently joined our board as an artist trustee. Americans for the Arts describes social change as, quote, both the process and effort of positively altering societal conditions. It encompasses a range of outcomes, healing, increased awareness, attitudinal change, more diverse and increased civic participation, movement building and policy changes to name just a few. We chose this specific topic for the first panel, given artists longstanding role in advocating and affecting social change. Our discussion today will illuminate specific works and values of our panels and examine the opportunities we as the MSM community have to become more activated in our efforts to use our powerful gifts as artists to lead positive change. Before panelists give their own welcome to you, I want to reaffirm MSM's commitment to cultural inclusion and our stance against racism. We stand at the crossroads of history. We come from centuries of systematic barriers and inequities that have prevented people of color and other marginalized individuals from having the same opportunities and experiences as those of us who are white and granted a status of privilege in this society. We must take the time to acknowledge, listen, and learn about these racial injustices that we, people, have designed, created, and perpetuated within our society as well as within the world of performing arts. We must take intentional and deliberate action to break down and destroy these systems we must create and affect the necessary social change in order to live up to our values and commitment as members of the MSM community and to the world at large. As a frame for our collective work ahead, I share with you the following description of anti-racism. Everyone is impacted by the system of racism and therefore has to tenaciously walk against that system Dr. Beverly Daniel Tatum describes it such, quote, I sometimes visualize the moving walkway at an airport as the ongoing cycle of racism. Active racist behavior is equivalent to walking fast on the conveyor belt. Passive racist behavior is equivalent to standing still on the same walkway. No overt effort is being made, but the conveyor belt moves the bystander along to the same destination as those who are actively walking. Some of the bystanders may feel the motion of the conveyor belt. They will see the active racist ahead of them and will choose to turn around. But unless they are walking actively in the opposite direction at a speed faster than the conveyor belt, unless they are actively anti-racist, they will find themselves carried along with the others. This is why it is imperative that we, the MSM community, commit to our greater work and work through our artist role against this system. It is now my absolute pleasure and honor to have each of our panelists introduce themselves and tell you a little bit about what drew them to participate in today's discussion. Let's begin with you, Liza. Hi. Um, thank you, Joyce, Monica, and Michelle for organizing this panel and for inviting me to participate. I'm going to read my statement so that I can be clear and concise. And I also just want to thank everyone who is participating and joined to hear uh, the panel for, for taking part. I've spent my life in musical theater and have benefited from my white privilege. 
I have always understood that this is a form dominated by white creators and that the musical theater industry and canon is racist, sexist, and weightist. It offers little space for gender identification. In its storytelling, it generally promotes heteronormative relationships, and until recently, it has not been a space for disability. The industry has made some efforts toward inclusiveness, primarily with inclusive casting. However, there is much more work to do. Current events are forcing producers and theater company, companies to acknowledge racist practice and make change. But we have seen decades of discussion around racism in theater, and very little action has been taken. Ending the practice of non-white directors and choreographers only being hired to work on non-white shows is essential. The theatrical industry needs to be overhauled. This week, 300 theater artists of color signed a letter titled, We See You White American Theater, in which they define American theater as, quote, a house of cards built on white supremacy and fragility. The Broadway Advocacy Coalition is holding a forum on racism in the industry this week. And also this week, theater writer Griffin Matthews posted an indictment of Broadway in which he said, burn it down. We need a restart. This is not a time for white fragility, which often comes in the form of silence. We need action to promote social change. We need to increase, increase the presence of non-white writers, directors, choreographers, producers, designers, musicians, stagehands, press agents, and every other area of theater production. I have ideas and I want to hear what MSM student body has to say and come up with concrete plans to implement immediately. My social change goals include a structural change in the theatrical industry, including college theater programs, and supporting and empowering MSM students by creating opportunities for them to use their artistic gifts as a voice for social change. Thank you. Thank you, Liza. We'll now turn to Damien Sneed. Hello, everyone. My name is Damien Sneed, and I just want to say a little bit about myself for this panel. I was born in Augusta, Georgia, to two parents born in the 30s. They were the first in their family to be able to go to college and graduate with a degree. I was adopted, so by the time they raised me, they were in their 40s, but they had seen the blunt hand of racism and the civil rights movement here in America. From drinking from colored water fountains to being sometimes the very first on their school faculty as a person of color. I was reared by community while standing on the shoulders of those who came before me, such as James Brown in Augusta, my godmother, Jessie Norman in Augusta, Georgia, and also Lawrence Fishburne, who was born in Augusta, Georgia. All of them had a lifetime of work committed to innovation and the celebration of black excellence. After matriculating to Howard University, an esteemed historically black college and university, my piano professor, Dr. Raymond Jackson, initiated a burning desire within me to follow in his footsteps. As a doctoral student at Juilliard, his dissertation focused on the solo piano works of African-American composers. Since that time, I've come to realize that one of my callings and responsibilities is to raise awareness to the world of all African-American composers. Traveling around the world as an ambassador of the United States of America, using the tool of music as a universal language, there still appears to be a dichotomy because while lyrics and aesthetic principles say I am free as viewed by the world, here in my own country, I still face marginalization, prejudice, racism, and the chains of ignorant tradition that see me as a black man, an African-American male, as a criminal, a miscreant, or even a thug just because of the color of my skin and the facts of my cultural background and roots. So here I am as a multi-genre artist who moves beyond the commercial genuflection of genre. Yet I'm a person of color, an American who communicates through the medium of music. And it is an honor to be a part of this community, the Manhattan School of Music, as I believe we are affecting change in the world, 
we are the revolution and we are a community who loves we are a community who is on one accord in unity and we will see the other side of this thank you damien kelly Thank you so much. Uh, it's really an honor to be here. And what, um, what a full and troubled time it is in the world for us to have a, be having this discussion. Um, I just want to give a bit of background. Like many of you students, I, I was a student in Manhattan School. I was in the orchestral performance program. I thought that's the career path that I wanted to take. And um, I was very, very nearly on that path for the rest of my career. Uh, as a runner-up at the New York Philharmonic, I was a sub there, and then wait, later went on to get a job at the New Jersey Symphony. But actually, as a note, before that, I won an audition. Um, per my program's um, training, I won an audition for a major orchestra behind a screen in three rounds. And then at the end of that blind, so-called blind process, um, I was not given the job. They decided, the, the music director said he was not interested in hiring me. Um, that was a kind of a, a seminal moment for me. I think it was not the only thing that turned my gaze from an orchestral career. I think I realized, as I actually had the job in the New Jersey Symphony, that I wanted to respond more directly to the world, not through the filter of a large organization and what it decides to do. I think the large organizations like orchestras sometimes are slow to respond to social change. I wanted to move faster. So even at a time when my career was not very established or set, um, one of the ways that I found a way to make a difference in social change was to create an organization called Music Kitchen Food for the Soul. Um, I bring top artists. I realize I play all over the world and I, I play with colleagues who play all over the world and I realize that not everybody has access um, to the fine concert halls, but that, that the arts and music are an essential part of us. So I wanted to make sure that everybody had access to that. 15 years later, we've reached um, some 30,000 shelter clients and um, you know, from coast to coast, from New York to Los Angeles to Paris. And I think at a time like this, it's important to remember um, well, my project, Music Kitchen, remembers those who don't have a voice. And I think that is what um, a lot of social change is about. So Music Kitchen created a program called Forgotten Voices, where we take the, um, the feedback from the homeless shelter clients and uh, set it to music by 15 award-winning composers. We were to have played the world premiere of that project in Carnegie Hall with, uh, in partnership with Carnegie Hall, but of course the pandemic but I think, isn't it, really, um, isn't it really kind of ironic that rather than, this is a 17 month long project, rather than leading to that concert, the last several months have really torn back the veil on why such a project is necessary. Um, like Damien, I, you know, I've experienced racism my entire life. I grew up in South Carolina, um, I grew up knowing that the Ku Klux Klan marched through my high school and um, you know, being denied auditions that I won and all sorts of things like that. Uh, but I think that, I think that we as musicians, no matter what the circumstances, we have to learn to, and, and especially us as classical musicians, we, you know, our art form is focused in the prior 400 years. We have to make sure that we remain in the consciousness of our time and respond to the needs of our time and use the full range of our resources, including 400 years of music. So anyway, I'm, I'm really honored to be part of this discussion. I hope that in being part of it, we can, you know, we're at a time when our, our profession is reduced to two dimensional digital platforms, but we still have the power of the world. Um, music can change the world. And we, um, I think it is our responsibility as artists to figure out how we can do that in challenging times. Thank you. Thank you, Kelly. And the final panelist to introduce themselves is Anthony Roth Costanzo. 
Thank you. It's a great honor for me to be with these great thinkers. And I'm just listening to everybody make their statements. And I'm realizing that these are people who have built their lives and their careers around taking action. And that is something that I feel um, you have to condition yourself to do. And it's very easy in today's world not to do that. Um, and this moment is teaching all of us that not only do we have to listen, because there's been a lot of discussion about listening, but we have to absorb. And then we have to be mindful and uh, intentional about what actions we take, but we also can't uh, let too much time go by. We have, to, we have to act fast and act now. My journey um, to where I am in this moment has been winding. I started on Broadway, I did film, uh, and then I went to Princeton for my undergrad, and then I ran a dance company, and then I went to grad school at MSM, and then I wound up as an opera singer, and then I started producing things. So I've been all over the place. But I have this strange voice, right? I'm a countertenor, um, I am an odd bird, I'm queer in an industry when I began singing in it in which, you know, people, people, baritones were disguising their sexuality so that they could get cast as Don Giovanni. So I knew that I had to carve my own path um, and define my own persona. And I've realized that <clears throat> defining what art you make and how you're gonna make it and not just getting hired for a job, that is, the kind of action that we need to take in a broader sense. Art is political. And it's not political as in Republican or Democrat necessarily. It's political because it can change the way people think more effectively and more quickly than almost anything. So today, I'm really excited to be here, mostly to listen to these amazing people and let them inspire me, but also to have this discussion about how can we shape the art that we make, the work that we do, so that we are being the change. And as President Obama said recently, let's get to work. Wonderful. Thank you all of the panelists for those introductory comments. Now, as Anthony says, let's get to work. We are going to use this time together over the next hour or so to engage in a series of questions that this panel and I have created and developed together. We also invite all of our guests to submit questions you may have along the way through the chat feature. We will be keeping those who are not panelists' microphones muted, but you can type your questions in the chat box. These will be fielded by my colleague, Monica Christensen. And then in the last 20 to 25 minutes of this panel discussion, we will actually collate those questions and as time permits, allow for guest questions to come to the panelists to be answered at the end. I also want to remind everyone that today's panel discussion is being recorded. This means that after this event, it will be shared both with those of you who have registered as well as the broader MSM community. So as we think about our role as the artists and the opportunity to affect social change, I'm actually going to give this first question to Kelly. She talked a little bit about her work um, in this realm, and I'd like to ask you, Kelly, can you illuminate more for us how your work and role as an artist has been able to effectively make social change? Yes. Well, Music Kitchen was the pioneer organization in bringing top artists into homeless shelters. When I started that, that was a struggle against uh, the status quo. I had to convince people that that was a worthwhile endeavor that that wasn't coddling homeless people into complacency, um, that it was, you know, that there is value in, um, of course, we, we offer honoraria and not artist fees um, to be able to spread those resources further, but that still, there was a lot of pushback. And I found that to be um, insulting on two levels about paying the artists. That means that if, if I play this concert over here at Lincoln Center or Carnegie Hall or, or any other hall, and I deserve to be paid, but I, I play this concert over here for people who are homeless, um, that I don't deserve to be paid or the artists that are with me, then that is a statement on the people that we're playing for. And that's the kind of paradigm shifting 
that I think that Music Kitchen has undertaken over the 15 years. Um, and also, I think, you know, Music Kitchen exists, has existed up until this point, up until the Forgotten Voices Project, only to bring comfort and uplifting and the top, um, you know, the best that classical music has to offer into the homeless shelter. It has never existed to play concerts for the public, although we artists individually play concerts all over the world. But now, one of the most powerful things that Music Kitchen has ever done and that I've ever created in my career is the idea that we now take the voices of the 30,000 people that we've worked with. And now for the first time, we are bringing that to the public in center stage at Carnegie Hall. I think that is a, it is a really powerful vehicle. I've revered their messages over 15 years. They mean the world to me to hear what they feel about our concerts, what impact it's having. But I think that the, the biggest power, and we made, we made a, um, a priority to premiere those works to the shelter clients first. So that's another paradigm shift that we've done. Um, we're taking the idea of special access and we're reversing the paradigm. But for this particular project, Forgotten Voices, to take their messages and bring them to the public, uh, that is something that I'm really proud of with that project. And it's the kind of social change that um, that I think we're we're obviously ripe for in the world and in the in you know what what is the value of a life? What is the value of um, you know? I think we've seen this week um, this this terrible tragedy to George Floyd's family and Breonna Taylor. And you know this is um, as as was described in the funeral. This is a man of humble beginnings. We don't normally venerate and, and acknowledge people of humble beginnings, but I think that's, that's the paradigm shift that we are, uh, that's the precipice that we are, we are currently standing on. And that's a change that I think Music Kitchen has been working for 15 years to uh, help bring about. Thank you. And I, oh. Liza? Oh, I'm sorry. I thought I heard someone speaking. In terms of taking that one step further, I know when I was speaking with our panelists in preparation for this event, one of our panelists, Anthony Roth Costanza, said that he saw through his art a way to see people beyond what perhaps we initially um, take in through their appearances and the way in which we interact with them, his respect for his artists and colleagues on stage and within organizations has changed. And Anthony, I wonder if you could share with us some of your viewpoints around how have your experience shaped the way in which you are now addressing art with respect for seeing people for people? Absolutely. I think that um, there's a very special connection that I just want to speak to as, as we're thinking about these things that you make uh, with audience, especially in a space, but when you're making music, as so many of us are, and telling stories, um, you're sort of promoting and, uh, and teaching a kind of empathy, right? People are sitting uh, and watching you and watching a story which is different from their own or similar to their own, and they're understanding it in a different way. So I think that's what's been really important. Um, but as we as we, the, the structures that exist, and we've been talking about this in, in a societal context, but if we now zoom into the arts, the structures that exist are not serving us in the way that they always need to. And so I just encourage all of us, all of us who are creating, all of us who are interpreting, to go outside of those structures. And we talk about, we talk about certain buzzwords a lot of, uh, of the time about education um, and uh, audience development and building communities and all of that. But I think we really need to examine what that means. How are we reaching the kinds of people who need more empathy? I feel like if we could get people to, to uh, listen to music more and, and experience this act of music making, there's a way of having them understand these different stories, which then calls into question, what stories are we telling? And how are we telling them? And what are the perspectives? So, you know, uh, I'm, I'm constantly trying to connect with different artists 
with different audience members and bring those perspectives into whatever I'm doing, which means that I, I try and have no um, preconceived notion or rigid, con rigid construction about the kinds of art that I make, the kinds of art I participate in, so that it's constantly changing and we're constantly shaping something new uh, and something that has the ability to speak in important ways. Thank you. And I'm going to field the next question with Damien. And one of the things that we were talking about on our panel was how artists are actively engaging specifically through their creative work. We've just heard a little bit from Anthony about this. We've heard from um, Kelly and Liza in her opening statement. But Damien, can you take us a step further and, and illuminate for us ways in which um, you have yourself and you have seen artists engage in social change through their creative work. Definitely. I, I just like to read a definition for all of us from the American Sociology Association. Uh, it says that social change deals with dynamics of social movements such as, of course, labor, civil rights, feminists, LGBTQ, democracy, and environmentalist movements, both today and historically. So personally, uh, as we're approaching uh, this initiative of cultural inclusion, I think about some of the projects that I've had uh, an opportunity to do. Recently, I wrote an opera uh, called Marion's Song about the life of Marian Anderson. And the opera was uh, championing the fact that she was very silent and resilient in her fight for civil rights. But also it brought out the fact that last year happened to be 400 years that African Americans or Africans were brought to America as slaves. Uh, but also it points out uh, the feminist movement. Last year was a championing moment for uh, women getting the right to vote. And Eleanor Roosevelt was a very key figure uh, in Marian Anderson being allowed to sing at the footsteps of Abraham Lincoln. Also uh, for the March on Washington Film Festival, uh, I've been commissioned by the Tuskegee Airmen uh, this coming uh, September to create a rhapsody. It was a symphony, we'll do that later but a rhapsody honoring the legacy of the Tuskegee Airmen. They represent uh, those who uh, allowed the United States Armed Forces to end and obliterate uh, segregation in those who fight in our various uh, parts of the military. But what's interesting in my study, Eleanor Roosevelt yet again was someone who uh, rode on the back of a plane of one of the fighters, the, the African-American fighters. And she spoke to her husband Franklin Roosevelt, and that is how uh, people of color, black men, uh, and even some some women had a chance to be a part of the Tuskegee Airmen project, the Tuskegee Airmen movement. And there are a lot of projects that I've worked in, but I wanted to say, as we're moving forward, our conversations uh, should continue to be didactic and to educate each other. But even in that instance, uh, the change, social change came historically through a person of color and also a person that was not of color, Eleanor Roosevelt. I just wanted to point that out, that it's interesting that if you look throughout history as we're trying to move forward, the th main theme of my opera, as I said last week, was two steps forward, one step back. Marian Anderson had so many times things happen to her, but yet in our lives, no matter what uh, point of cultural inclusion we want to look at in our careers, in our families, in our relationships, many times we seem to move forward and then we move one step back. So I think uh, together, just as uh, we see in history or historically, I think now in this time and in the future, we too can continue to move forward and advance. Thank you. And in this way, we're talking a lot. There's been themes that are coming out in the conversations with the panelists about forgotten voices, lost voices. There's a historical narrative both in the academy as well as within arts organizations at large that have erased or marginalized the voices of African-American or African diaspora creators, as well as many other marginalized individuals who do not fit this normative white male um, figure. And I know, Liza, in your opening comments, you spoke quite a bit about the commitment and stance that you are taking, the way in which you're thinking about affecting change and I wonder if you could talk to us more specifically about ways in which your art within musical theater first has been successful in raising um, the spotlight to actually include individuals, people of color, but also thinking about the work ahead because it hasn't been enough. 
Well, we haven't been successful. Um, what has been done has been extremely limited. Um, as I said in my, when I first spoke, uh, it's inclusive casting, but that um, has also been limited. Um, there's a very big problem with marginalizing um, African-American um, artists and only working on African-American shows, non-white artists working on non-white shows. So it's very deep, it's very thick, and it really does need uh, a very, very much a structural change. Within productions, there has been some very recent, within, you know, with the last couple of years, change occurring uh, in terms of looking at classic musical theater. Um, and how to re-envision those productions like the Daniel Fish production of Oklahoma um, and how to, how to make those, those classic pieces more relevant to today and to move away from um, the racism, sexism, et cetera, that is, is part of, of those productions. Uh, I also would call on artists, um, and it's very difficult because of the way the theater is structured and the power structures, but even within a show that's being produced um, in a way that it's been produced before, for each individual artist to take the opportunity to take a musical number or a scene and turn it in such a way that it does address um, issues that have not been addressed in musical theater. So the power structure is so um, oppressive in terms of keeping, maintaining the status quo and in playing to who the audience is um, and the, the restrictions on audience due to cost, uh, that it really is a tourist industry right now, um, and how that affects regional theaters and how regional theaters and Broadway need to work much harder at publicizing shows. Um, I had a very interesting comment from an African-American director who said he was out of the city working on a show to regional theater, and he went to a um, restaurant in which uh, there was a large African-American community and he was talking to some people about the show and none, none of them had even heard about the show, his show. And it was just blocks away from the theater. So the effort's not being made. It's just simply not being made. And um, it, the conversations have been going on for decades and it doesn't change. So there's a lot of movement right now, and uh, I'm hopeful that this will really make something, some new things happen. May I add something about yes. Broadway, since that also touches my heart? <laughs> I was really honored to, to spend uh, 13 months as the fiddler for Fiddler on the Roof on the most recent Broadway revival. And although it was uh, the only time in, in Fiddler history in 50 years when the person playing fiddler, the fiddler uh, solos were, was not actually on stage. Um, and it was the only time in my career that I've ever had such a soloistic role and not been seen. I was um, simultaneously embraced by the company and embraced by the press um, for my work in that role. So I think it was, although they did not go full Hamilton with the casting and, you know, um, you know, they went more traditional casting, but through the solos that they added to the Broadway score for me that were not normally there, um, it made a space for me in a way that I, I'm eternally grateful. Um, and, and I was so embraced to, um, you know, to take on the role as, as the fiddler for the most recent Broadway production. So there are, there are some things that happen, but I, I, I see all of, the, all of the wonderful observations and points that Liza's making about Broadway, I think are largely um, that's obviously pervasive in the industry and the, the exceptions are just that. Kelly, if I can just ask a follow-up question. You mentioned that there were um, solos that were added, I think was the word that you used, 
to create space for you. Can We've been talking a lot about what it's like to be um, a person of color within this art form and not always feeling as though one can bring them their whole self. Can you talk a little bit more about what you mean by um, making space for you specifically? Well, I had, you know, I had a very traditional classical career and I did not envision Broadway as being part of it. So I wasn't totally sure this was something that I wanted to do. And as I was considering it, um, the, the person who was standing to engage me who actually happens to be the manager to Itzhak Perlman and, and Joshua Bell and also a Broadway coordinator. So he's someone who understands my world. Um, he said, why don't you listen to it and, and decide? And I went and I listened to the wrong thing. I listened to the 1971 film with featuring Isaac Stern that was arranged by John Williams. And within that score, there's this wonderful four minute violin concerto of sorts that appears really because it's a film, it can be during the, the opening credits where there's no, there was no, and so I lobbied very heavily to get that four minute concerto into our production. There just simply was no place for it. It just has no dramatic place in the story. And when you have a film and you have opening credits, you have more freedom. So in lieu of that, they, they really tried to do it, but there just was no place for it. Um, but they appreciated that I'm a soloist and brought that to the show. There normally are no solos. And when I finally listened to the Broadway score, bum, ba, dum, bum, 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 that's really it. Um, so they, in the, in the rehearsal process, there just became more and more moments where they realized that I could respond musically to the dramatic action. I could, you know, uh, collaborate with the actors, with Danny Burstein and Jessica Hecht, um, respond to it. There are places where I was alone in the theater, you know, there, so again, they created space where the only sound being heard was, was my solo and that doesn't normally happen. Um, so I think it was, it was an organic process during the rehearsals and uh, as the, the arranger and the music director realized more and more moments that could, where that could happen, they just sort of got added on <laughs> each of the rehearsals. There were more um, so by the end of the process, and then there were some that we had to take back. They tried to put a big, they tried to put a big concerto like moment in the bows, but you know, when, when, you know, 2000 people or 1700 people are applauding, that's just never going to be heard. So there were some that were taken out in the end after previews ended, but, um, uh, I'm, I'm eternally grateful because it gave me the clay with which to mold. And as if eight shows a week were not enough, I then took that experience of 13 months and created the first ever Fiddler solo disc. Wonderful. And Anthony, I'm, I'm going to ask you this question um, on the heels of what we've been talking about with Broadway and these systems that are in place where people um, are in dis power decision-making roles to create a season. And with that power comes an opportunity to think more broadly, more inclusively about the repertoire that's performed, the individuals who are cast. And I, I want to ask you a question that I know um, our students have been thinking about, which is last season, the Met produced Poor Game Bess. And then when they announced their season, even though there will be a delay in its start, we found that it was almost a retraction of momentum. And to use Damien's words from the Marian song, two steps forward, one step back. Tell us what you felt when seeing the Met Opera, if you don't mind, just um, or any arts organization that's thinking about its programming and what you're thinking of as an artist through both um, the lens of affecting change, speaking with decision makers. How do you see your role and what can we help our guests who are here today to be thinking about ways in which they can engage in that conversation as well. Thanks for that. And let me give you a concrete example um, of something that I did um, when I was at the Met. So, um, and, and this is really a way to illustrate what I was saying in a broader way before. I think it's our job as artists to do these things. So I'm hired by the Met to sing an opera, Akhenaten, and uh, I, I could just show up and do a good job. And if I do that, um, th that, that would make the opera good and we might you know, get the house 80% full, which would be a big house for the Met, right? They don't always sell out that way. But what I tried to do in, in a number of ways was to get 
this material, which I knew could reach people and affect them, to into other communities. And I saw it as my job not to just do what they told me, what the what they call, you know, what what some people call outreach, which we we all think I think is a problematic word, but rather um, to to come up with a creative project. So what I did and what I proposed to the Met and what I wound up uh, through my relationships with people and connections, we wound up getting it funded by the Met and executed by the Met and supported by the Met was um, to ask the Brooklyn Youth Chorus, which is a wonderful organization of kids from all throughout New York City um, and from all different backgrounds, um, to uh, work with us in creating and, and work with amateur jugglers from all over the city. There was juggling involved in Akhenaten to create um, a, a really interesting 30 minute piece based around Philip Glass's music. We then, I, I got the Brooklyn Museum to partner with the Met and with the Brooklyn Youth Chorus. And I <clears throat> got the uh, uh, Manus Orchestra um, to partner with us as well and those students there. And we created with about 150 students and people from all different backgrounds, on a, a really entertaining 30 minute show linked to the Akhenaten production. And we were able to bring it to the Brooklyn Museum's first Saturdays, which is something that we identified as a really amazing opportunity for a community of all different kinds to see something entirely for free. The museum is completely free on Saturday. We set up shop, we got support to show, show this 30 minute piece which had excerpts from the opera for free for 12,000 people who came through the museum that day um, and who were able to come through from Brooklyn. And in that moment, I mean, I saw the people who came and I talked to them and we did it twice so that people could, could experience it in different ways. And they had never seen opera. They didn't have any connection to it. They didn't have any understanding, but they were struck emotionally by the experience that we were able to create. And so there was a community created around that and people were not invited even just with a discount ticket. We were going into their space. We were going into a different space. Um, and I think that was a large way to do it, but it's important to do it on a grassroots level. Um, I have made it a priority of mine to go into schools in the Bronx, in Brooklyn, in New York, in general, or wherever I am, in whatever country, whatever city I'm in, and, and connect with students. I think that it's so important that we find different ways to bring the art outside of the opera house. And then we were able to bring those people into the Met. And that, in my opinion, is part of the reason that the Met went on to sell out Akhenaten and for Akhenaten to be one of their best-selling shows ever, um, is because we were reaching out to these communities and people were responding to it. Now, obviously, as to your question of whether the progress, I, I think this is a, a question I would love to ask some of the other panelists. I think that Porgy and Bess was a wonderful opportunity to bring all of these artists of color into the Met, but it's also a complicated opportunity, right? Because as, as we were discussing, Porgy and Bess is a very siloed piece. Um, and it was also, uh, there was a recent panel that Janae Bridges led for LA Opera uh, that was really amazing, where a bunch of, of singers of color were talking about their different experiences. And one of them said, you know, Porgy and Bess was directed by a white man and conducted by a white man. And there's a dissonance there uh, with being told how to act in a way that is something you own um, by someone who's not a part of that, that world. And so I think um, it's, a, it's a complicated process. I guess my answer to it, but I, I don't know that I have the answers and so I'm very open. My approach last year with the Met, you know, before we got here, where we are now in the world, was um, the Met responds to sales of tickets. So if we can show them that they will get more audience, more of the demographic that they want, the new audience, if we go into those communities and, and we connect with those communities, then they'll be incentivized to do that. And they'll be incentivized to think about what, what will connect to those communities. So my answer, my proactive solution 
is to come up with the most brilliant idea you can to solve an institution's problem. And in that solution, show them the change that they need to make. Um, so, uh, and maybe that's not proactive enough. I'm totally ready to hear everybody's response about why that is or isn't a good strategy. I'm going to take a moment to pause and, and take Anthony up on his request. Is there a panelist who'd like to respond to that question? I, th I mean, I think there are a variety of ways to, to go about it. When you have the opportunity to be part of a large institutional production like that, and you can then channel your position um, to get them to expand their, their, um, their scope and how they reach people, I think that's all good. I think it's a question of where, you know, what position from which you are looking to, to move in the world. Um, you know, I, I mostly decided to detach from an orchestral position or a large institution in that sense as a performing artist and be a soloist. So I have other partnerships that I can then draw from. You know, I'm, I'm really, I remain ecstatic, even though our, uh, the pandemic has postponed us, that, you know, that I was able to go to Carnegie Hall and say, to me, this is the people's house. And, and would you co-present this project with me? And they said, yes. Um, so that's my action as a soloist and as a creator of Music Kitchen. But I think that the idea is that there's no one way. I think what you hear from all the panelists from, from your, and there's no one perspective from your, each of you, your unique perspective. Only you can have it. Only your unique perspective, your assimilation. I mean, I think Music Kitchen is not unique because we play concerts for the homeless. No, I think it is. I think it's my unique assimilation of my life experience as to why I created it this way um, and why I think it's effective through the lens of the way that I create it through my particular life experience and the things that, uh, that come out of that. Your unique life experience, your unique partnerships that you can draw from, your unique passions about the world, about music, about life, those are, the, those are the raw ingredients. And that when you're constantly thinking creatively, and um, as Anthony said, in, in a way that you can help another institution solve a problem that they have, then that's where your, your interests align. And that's where, the power, that's where your power is. Um, yeah, I think that it's all good, you know, whatever. And I think the next time I or Anthony or Liza or Damien or anybody will create a project, it'll be from that unique position, you know, that unique set of circumstances that yesterday or last year might not have existed. Um, yeah, I think, I think that to me, that's the most magical and amazing thing about our career. And that's one of the things I was talking about for wanting to detach from a large institution for my performing life, because I wanted to react in real time to the world that as I saw it. I didn't want to wait till an orchestra decided to do something. I wanted to, I wanted to have my own visions realized in, in real time. And I wanted to be the one to make that happen in concert and in partnership with others. So yeah, I think, I think it's all good. Dr. Griggs, may I say something? Yes. Yes, uh, this is in response, direct response to Anthony's uh, uh, what he just said, and also in continuation of what Liza said earlier. Uh, this probably will seem to be antithetical to a lot of my friends and colleagues and people of the African and African American diaspora, because I did hear that argument. Uh, many of my friends were complaining that Porgy and Bess was not uh, conducted by a black conductor. But uh, I'd just like to state uh, that they must remember that Porgy and Bess was also not written by a black exactly. composer. And right. therefore, I think this is why it's so phenomenal that our president, uh, James Gandry, before a lot of other institutions of performing arts and colleges of higher uh, learning, before they started uh, mimicking and imitating and copying his initiative, that was very bold to take a step. I'm so honored to be a part of our, our community because he made a statement that, of course, for this coming school year, we will feature uh, works by creators who are from the African and the African American diaspora, uh, because I also like to say too, it is very important to inform, to be didactic, and to educate when we're telling stories of uh, people, just for example, with that story, Porgy and Bess, about 
African American people and their history and where they came from. But it is extremely important that the narrative changes from keeping people on catfish row, oppressed, uh, uh, in a place of poverty, and that we get to see a different narrative and a different story. So as we are approaching the creators uh, from the African and African American diaspora, I'd like part of the challenge to be that uh, the presentation of those of color is not just something uh, in the past from the days of slavery or from the days of the reconstruction era after that, but it should also be seeing people of color in a place of equality. Perhaps we should be like, uh, you know, Star Trek, Gene uh, Roddenberry, who was a paraplegic, but yet he believed to dream. That's why he said uh, he was bold enough to go a place where a man had never gone before. And that's why on Star Trek in the 60s, before uh, Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated, before uh, JFK and RFK were assassinated, we see that there was an African, Uhura, over communications. There was Ikara Sulu, who was there uh, on, the, on the helm. And there was also uh, Chekhov, a Russian, before the Iron Curtain fell. And there was Scotty. He was uh, Scottish, you know? So we have all of these cultures coming together. And that's why I love sci-fi. I love Star Trek. But I think we should also look to the future as we present these new works and as we present things that allow us to dream and to have a different vantage point to see ourselves moving forward in the future. I want to say the thing about the vision also, like also not just looking forward, but looking backward. We can look backward to uh, the more equality that, that, that conservatories often skip over. And the, the music of Joseph Bologna Chevalier de Saint-Georges from 1744 to 1799. He was one of the most accomplished composers of his time. He was the most accomplished conductor of his time. He was the person who commissioned the Haydn Paris symphonies. He conducted their premiere. You know, there's so many things about our standard music history that we don't learn. You know, our place in history does not begin at Reconstruction. It begins hundreds of years before. And I think that that's something that uh, the conservatories often skip over, um, even as it relates to the canon composers that we, that we do study. So I think that those images are important to see from you know, the future and the past. And this is a wonderful segue to this next question, which will be um, likely the penultimate question before we open it up to those that may be coming through the chat. So to, I would like to start with Damien um, and then Liza, because I heard in your opening remarks, Liza, both an interest in affecting change within the curriculum, the student experience, but also learning. And so Damien, to you, I'll start. As an institution, as a conservatory, MSM wants to commit and recommit our efforts in training artists who have both an inquisitiveness, a curiosity, and who have a desire to learn in a way that represents more equitable works um, in terms of what's represented, but also how that fields their, fuels their passions as artists, professional artists, as to make social change. And I'm wondering, as we think about really concrete steps that MSM can be considering and taking, what are your thoughts around how MSM can create a community of training artists who are committed to this work? Yes, I think there are a few things that we can do. First of all, uh, it's conversations like this, and we cannot be afraid uh, or have fear or trepidation around where people are afraid to ask a question. Sometimes with uh, the constant change of uh, social dialogue uh, uh, and linguistical uh, melody, people aren't sure exactly what to say without uh, encroaching upon, uh, you know, offending someone. And I think during this time for people to have understanding, all of us are from various sectors and segments of America, the South, the Northeast, some are from other countries, some are from different parts where racism is not the same as it is here in America. So we have to uh, obliterate and sort of remove this uh, semi-permeable barrier where people are afraid to ask questions because they're afraid they may use the wrong title, the, the wrong word, the wrong uh, way to call something. We have to be open to that and understand that people are not trying to be prejudiced and people are not uh, speaking uh, with an ignorance to hurt or to assassinate uh, or to annihilate, but only to get understanding. 
A second thing that is extremely important, as Kelly just said, in order to, uh, to understand uh, the music of so many marginalized groups, we have to have it available. And I know, uh, for example, a lot of African-American music is not readily available by publishers. A lot of it has been lost. But that's why, for example, I personally have already researched, I've actually ordered some, uh, a lot of music that I'm planning on donating to our library. And that way students will be able to see this music and perform the music. It's one thing to talk about it. It's one thing for the faculty to say, yes, we're willing to do it, but people need the actual tools, the resources. So that's one thing that I'm doing. Kelly knows a lot of this music. She's performed a lot of the music. Liza knows a lot of this music. She spoke about it. Anthony knows all uh, this music. And I think that's one thing that we have to do is a call to action to bring these scores, to bring recordings and to bring these types of, uh, you know, resources into the library. And then in addition to that, I think we just move forward with programming the music and not just stopping with this school year, but moving forward and programming the music of women, programming the music of LGBTQ, programming the music of uh, Asian Americans, Native Americans, uh, 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 those from the, the Indian diaspora and the Middle East, just we really need to be open uh, to getting more of a balanced, uh, representation of our community and a balanced representation of the world. Thank you. And Liza, I'd be interested in hearing as we've gone through the discussion today, what thoughts you're now having um, that could be shared with the guests today. Sorry. Um, <clears throat> yeah, well, first of all, I, I completely agree with Damien that we have to keep having these discussions. And I find that my students are much smarter than I am about all of this. And I want to give them opportunity to um, voice their um, concerns and their ideas. So that's something that I think is very important. Um, I also think it's very important at the school that we break down the silos between departments and between areas. I think we can learn so much from each other if we collaborate across areas. I think it would be, it's very important to have a platform for our students to create and make work that can be used towards social change. We have gifts as artists and we are able to reach people as artists in ways that other people can't. I think it would be amazing to have a, a course, a two semester course, that the first part could teach the history of um, activism and um, action in, um, in theater and in music and taught by faculty across areas. I think that within that section, we could have um, work with students on creating and developing material. And then part two of the course could be actual performances, helping students to continue to develop material and then present it and having different ways to present it so that we could reach the public and move beyond um, the MSM, MSM. But MSM has a very wide audience, as I've found with the musical theater productions. We get letters and comments from people that have nothing to do with the school. So there is an audience out there that we're already reaching, and I think that we could continue to reach. And I think that we really need to do something. I don't think it's enough for us to say, okay, students, we think you're all really talented and you have a lot to say. Go ahead and say that. Let's, let's do it. I think we have to really create a very clear, defined course or an, some kind of led initiative that students would actually have the opportunity to um, activate their, their art in this way. Thank you. Any final thoughts from the panelists before we move to taking questions from the chat room? Um, Liza, you had mentioned something about uh, being anti-racist. I think that was your analogy with the um, with the uh, the moving walkway. Was that your, yeah, in the beginning. So I mean, one of the things like we were talking about, I mentioned Joseph Bologna Chevalier de Saint-Georges. His legacy was actually intentionally erased by Napoleon. 
Napoleon wanted to erase this black man from French history. So that is one of the reasons tying into Damien's, that's one of the reasons that it's difficult to find his music because look, Napoleon literally tried to erase him from French history. He was too prominent a name. Um, I was, I just, in, in our real lives, I was able to visit the, um, the National Library of France and see some of his original scores. Um, but the National Library of France still only has one manuscript. That's what survives. Um, so I think, you know, anyway, to be anti-racist with some of this, some of it takes, you know, an extra effort to reverse the, the intentional acts of others. But at the same time, I just want to put out there, particularly for myself as a, a classical violinist who, who has a broader mind beyond classical, like I never, ever thought I would. <laughs> but I do still adore the canon. Um, for me personally, all of these discussions do not negate the canon of music that we all fell in love with. It is a, is it a, it's a both and situation, not a either or. Um, I'm still going to spend my career playing Beethoven. I love Beethoven or Bartok or Bach or whatever. Um, but I think that the, the inclusion of a wider array of history's talent is what is needed at this time. Thank you for that. So from our chat room, the first question was asked by an alum, Marlon Daniel, and he says um, among some of his comments that he performed a concert some years ago and afterwards one of the young students said to me, quote, I never knew there was such a thing as a black conductor. Now I can feel like I can do anything. He asks, how can we get more arts organizations to realize that you cannot have outreach without people of color being an integral part? And how can these organizations gain sensitivity to this issue? I'll just open this up to my panelists, colleagues. I've been a part of uh, an outreach department uh, last year uh, before coming to MSM when I was uh, assistant conductor uh, and composer in residence at Houston Grand Opera. I had a, a tertiary role uh, working with their uh, with their community outreach department, uh, and I don't really like the word outreach, uh, but you know it is what it is. Liza and I spoke about that earlier. Uh, I think the example just has to be set. I think it's going to take time uh, because people should know that there are black conductors, violinists, pianists, uh, composers, musicians, administrators, college presidents. Uh, you know, if you think about uh, the arts community. Uh, managers, promoters, we don't see them a lot. Uh, and I think if there were more uh, texts that were available, speaking about Dean Dixon, a black conductor, Willie Waters, who many times would lead the Metropolitan Opera radio quiz, uh, Howard Watkins, he's on staff there, Kazim Abdullah, I could list people on and on, Roger Cox, who MSM had conduct, I believe, the season before I came. Uh, I think that as long as we just set an example, uh, sometimes you can use your voice to yell and scream and people won't hear you. And after a while, as the story goes, you just have to keep marching. And I believe eventually people will begin to march to the sound of our drumbeat. Uh, they may be at a different tempo. Their choreography may be a little different, but I think if we just continue to march forward and march ahead, I think sooner or later, people will catch on. I also think there's a little bit of Napoleon in, in, uh, in respect. I mean, I think that we, we also have to acknowledge that there is willful resistance to some of those ideas. I don't, I don't think it's by accident. I don't think it's by um, lack of knowledge in some cases. I think there is a willful resistance. Um, you know, if we think about it, a conductor is, the, is an orchestra is, a, is practically a, um, a ninth, and, you know, it's like an 18th century monarchical microcosm. And the conductor is the power center of that monarchy. And I think that if you look at the analogous situations, there is sometimes pushback towards the power center um, being held by people of color. You see that in corporations, you see that in politics. Um, I think an orchestra is no different or choir or whatever. Um, I think that there has to be some learning involved, um, some assimilation of people to drop their their strongly held or long held biases against uh, um, people of color. I think that's a, that's a real thing. I think there's work 
that has to happen in that regard. Um, I think history, or well, history has shown that progress is not a straight line. It's either the two steps forward, one step back, or sometimes it's just a jagged, you know, a jagged meandering path. Um, but I think, you know, there's, I think that, that attitudes are shifting. You know, I've had people come, you know, when I was at Manhattan School, there were two orchestras that I was, I was concert master of both the symphony and the chamber orchestra. And um, I had people come up to me at the receptions and say, I've never seen a black woman concert master before. And I just eventually started saying, well, now you have, <laughs> you know, um, you know, skip ahead to my professional life. I play as concert master of orchestras when I do orchestra. And somebody came to me at a reception once and said, wow, when you walked out there, I didn't think you were going to be able to do it. You don't know me. Why would you think that? <laughs> He's like, but you came out and you did a really great job. I mean, I, people are sometimes very revealing of their, um, of their mindsets. And so I think, you know, an orchestra is like a monarchy. There are parts of it actually that in general need to evolve to a more, um, you know, a more inclusive sense of artistry. I think you have a hundred people on stage who all are very good at what they do, yet we recognize only one person really to have artistic you say in that. And I think the, the, the idea of that is, is shifting a little bit you know, becoming more egalitarian. But with that comes a lot of other things that I think we have to kind of work to chip away. And speaking yeah, of just, uh, Liza. I'll just add to that, um, it, it, it is in fits and starts with Broadway. Something happens and then it doesn't make any change occur. Um, perfect example, I think, is A Strange Loop, written by Michael R. Jackson. It was performed off-Broadway. It had sold out, completely sold out um, audiences, and he won the Pulitzer Prize. Yet, Broadway producers are resistant to producing African-American artists. So it has happened in the past. It has hap happened again this year. And this new moment has to make change occur in real, in real time. And that's what I think many, many organizations are putting their foot down and just saying, no, this can't, this can't occur anymore. This has to change at this point. We can't keep having this discussion over and over and over and it never changes. Thank you. So as we take that action, I'm, I'm going to open this up to any of the four panelists. And we have a question from Sean Ritchie, who says um, that he teaches a Fundamentals of R&B Music class. Um, this is part of our MSM summer program, which is for 8 to 18 year olds. And it's an opportunity to explore many genres from soul, rock and roll, Motown, funk, hip hop. I find there's a big connection between jazz and Broadway. It would be nice to see more of that in MSM from the camp up through the college. Liza, you spoke about cross-disciplinary opportunities, and I know Damien and others have spoken of this as well. What are your thoughts on how we can make something such as cross-genre experiences possible for our students, and if it is already happening somewhere where you could illustrate an example? Yes, I'd like to speak to that. Uh, Sean, I teach a course uh, that started this past school year called African American Music History. The text is Eileen Southern's uh, book on the music of Black uh, Americans, which is excellent. And in that course, we go uh, all the way back from Africa, uh, the gourd, and even in Australia, the didgeridoo, an early instrument there from Aboriginals. And it goes all the way through the Middle Passage to slavery, to work songs, spirituals, art songs. Uh, and then we spend a significant amount of time talking about uh, Little Richard and rock and roll, soul music, James Brown, uh, Motown, Barry Gordy, funk, hip hop, and neo soul music. All, and that course is open, I believe, to everyone in the, uh, in the school, uh, undergraduate and graduate students, because last year I had an undergraduate classical student and I had a graduate jazz composition major. Uh, also, I teach uh, a singer-songwriter course where singer and songwriters are encouraged to come in from various departments, interdisciplinary uh, 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 collaborations. And then also I am actually over the gospel ensemble, which meets and we have a lot of Liza students uh, from the musical theater department. And we also have uh, students from the jazz department, of course. And uh, in that uh, ensemble, not only do we listen to music and perform music, but it's a lot of learning 
And also I encourage the students to write uh, and to compose and to work together. So those are some things that are going on and I would love to hear from you after this to hear some of the things you're doing and how maybe I can implement even more in the classes and courses that I'm teaching. And I just want to say to echo that, that I think opera students should be taking your course too. You know what I mean? I, I think that we get so isolated and we get so insular and that's part of the reason that there's not more creative thinking, there's not more diversity. Everybody gets in this circle and in their own cycle. And I see that all the time in opera companies and in conservatories. Um, you know, we should be learning as opera singers from an R&B concert or a class. You know, when I, uh, the, I remember the, the first singer who taught me anything about singing that I loved when I was a kid was Ella Fitzgerald. When I went to see Mick Jagger, I thought, that is the best performer I've ever seen, bar none. And what is it about the way that these people are making sound or telling stories that we need to do? Because opera's not connecting to the general public. We know that. These people are. That's what we should be learning from. Then we have to apply the rigor of classical tradition to it and all of the, the bel canto technique that we've been learning with our voice teachers, all those wonderful, wonderful things. I'm not asking us to throw that away. I'm asking us to investigate and take apart what it is that's so exciting and wonderful and create that same energy in our, um, in our art form. I think there's not enough of that and it doesn't just stop with different kinds of music. It has to extend to dance. It has to extend to the museum. It has to extend to ways in which we can facilitate students um, and our colleagues going to other things that stretch them outside of their circle. I think that is so crucial. That way of thinking will then germinate, I hope, this is my theory, but I, I, in, in my experience it's been true, into being more inclusive of all kinds of things. So I think we need to, we definitely, I, I, you know, just echoing what Liza and Damien had said. And, and I forgot to I forgot to add last semester, uh, last year I took uh, Alexa Smith, the chief of staff and several students took a trip with me to DC to the National Smithsonian <laughs> Museum of African American History and Culture. And that's open for anybody. Of course, I can't do it now because of social distancing limitations, but I do it every year. We drive, we take buses, we train. Uh, so if anyone wants to go or faculty, I'll, I'll do that at least every school year. Great, and I wanted to mention, I've been in meetings with Michelle and uh, Ingrid um, with the jazz department and figuring out ways to collaborate. I've been in meetings with um, Donna Vaughn and Maitland to collaborate with the voice department, as well as Rebecca Charno in outreach. Um, we're cooking up all sorts of different ideas. Um, and uh, just yesterday I met with Michelle and Ingrid and we have so much crossover with um, so many of the departments at the school. And to have jazz musicians in dance classes and to have jazz musicians playing for dance classes and to have budding choreographers work with the jazz musicians to create work and present that at the school. Uh, I, I just think it, 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 it's such an, um, it's so obvious <laughs> and we need to take advantage of it. I also feel like the Broadway, I've, I've spending 18 months on Broadway, 13 with Fiddler and, and six with uh, Sunset Boulevard. I just was amazed at the business of Broadway, the success of Broadway. You know, now it's, there's a pandemic, but under, under normal circumstances, there is, there is no orchestra. If you take the, the scenario, um, 50 to 100% filled, same theater, same city, same music, night after night after night after night. Name me one orchestra that can do that. Name me one string quartet that could do that. Name one soloist that could do that in, in the classical world. Zero, zero. There's something, there's something that we can learn from Broadway um, in the classical world for how to really connect um, with audiences. I'm just amazed. We, you know, Fiddler ran for some 400 performances. 400 of the same music in the same theater in the same city night after night after night you know i think there we we need to cross pollinate our understanding of how the business models work of course broadway closes up like like a circus tent if, if a dime is lost we don't want that from for classical music 
But for, aside from that, there are other things that we can observe and learn about how they reach people and the success model. I remember that there's actually a woman, when we did the Sunset Boulevard, we were on stage um, and the orchestra became a star. Like, you know, the, the Andrew Lloyd Webber score is amazing. And the orchestra was like the stars of like the actors, which was unusual for a Broadway show. And I remember this woman who's, who was waiting in the rope line after we you know, were leaving the stage door. She was like, oh my God, that was just so amazing. I mean, you could like, you could just like do that. Like you could just, you could, I would just come to hear you guys just like play. Like I would just do that. I'm like, you know what? We, we actually do do that. <laughs> there are a lot of places where you could go hear that. <laughs> So somehow there's this disconnect because she thought I could just go hear the orchestra play. I would love that. I'm like, there's a, that's a real thing. We actually do that too. <laughs> this is so great. And in fact, in the chat room, there's a lot of enthusiasm around this idea of cross genre learning and interaction between departments and among departments. I'm going to ask one final question because believe it or not, our time for this and a half session is drawing down. But I do want to um, first ask any participant who is in the room if you have a resource that you would like to share. This is an opportunity for us to all learn from one another. We're also um, listening. We're, we're hearing you. We want to be able to take your ideas and think about them and how that might apply to the greater work within the MSN community. So if you haven't already um, submitted an idea or a question, even if we can't answer it today, it is definitely worth stating so that we can hear your voice as we continue our conversation at MSM. The last question I wanted to ask is if we're talking about how we can start to create and incite um, our students' interest in this work, is there a way where as a conservatory we can be thinking about shaping our community through incoming students and how we might even reimagine what our expectations are for a future MSM student who we're, we're welcoming to our community. And I'm gonna open that up to any one of our panelists to ponder or consider. Well, I've wanted from, I, the program started four years ago. I've been in leadership for two years. And what's very important to me and has been important from the beginning is that students become creators. That I'm not just working to teach and train students to be, go out into the world, be hired and perform other people's work. That's part of it and that's very important. But I want my students to actively be engaging in creating work and, um, that's that's something that I I would like the program to be known for to be known as a place that not only produces performers that produces creators as well. For me, I would love one of the one of the things that I'm a big proponent of for any students that I have is I feel that in the in the classical world in general and in the string in the violin world in particular there is an epidemic of, of just playing the notes all in the right place at the right time with good intonation and then done. But I'm a really big proponent of um, playing with artistry and with um, not just emotion, but playing with artistry and nuance and small details. If you were to go like in Damien's world and my, my husband is a percussionist, they talk about the feel. If, you, if you're to sit down to a drum set and you play a beat of some sort, play a funk beat, play a, this beat, play a that beat, play a jazz, you know, you can, there's a way to play all four notes in the right place, but it doesn't have the feel of funk. It doesn't have the feel of jazz. In classical music, we don't talk enough about that. We talk about playing all the notes in the right place and it, with good intonation and good shifting and good bow control and good sound and all that stuff. But there is, there is every composer, every era has a feel. And I think that, why is this important? Because when you go and play for an audience, uh, I think orchestras lose audiences when they don't really feel, when it's just a ritualized connection and not an organic and not a, a passionate connection to what's happening on stage. There's only so far the shiny brochure can, can take us. There has to actually be a real, artistic connection 
beyond, oh, look what I can do. Um, so that's, I think that's essential from the artistic side of things. Then I think that, you know, when, when one goes to school, everybody's different. Their experience is, is different. And it also depends on whether they're an undergraduate or a graduate student. Yeah. And in, in a city like New York, there's so much going on. But certainly as early as you can, but as certainly as soon as makes sense, the community that you go to school in is your community for now. That's, that's your community. Find out more about it. Be, be present to it. You know, we have, especially in classical music, we have so many hundreds of years of learning to cover. And it's so all consuming, but, you know, and we have a lot of repertoire to learn, but as soon as you can start to broaden your mindset beyond, um, beyond the conservatory, the walls of the conservatory, to the community, to the wider world, and then you'll start to see connections of how is it that what I do can, can improve the world around me, the community around me. Um, you know, we go from thinking very siloed to a more global perspective. And just to piggyback on that, I think, as Damien pointed out, you know, Jim has been a real leader, our president, in <clears throat> putting this initiative forward of African and African American composers uh, for the next year. And I think that we can, we can continue what he's starting and what all of you have started by really setting ourselves apart and being the school that trains people for the future of the art form, not for the current state of it. And that's, you know, we have, we're going through this moment of change, but if we get way ahead of it by being incredibly interdisciplinary, by being an inclusive place where, you know, we're talking as, as, uh, as Liza was saying about uh, teaching, teaching our students to be entrepreneurs, teaching our students to create as well as to perform, to, to create opportunities. That's how I have a career. My career is not really so much about my singing. My career is about what I have been able to create around my singing. You know, singing is not even 50% of the battle. And a lot of conservatories are not teaching much more, like you're saying, Kelly, than, than the singing or than the music making. So I think when, when uh, Dr. Griggs talks about recruitment, as soon as people see that this is what MSM is doing, they'll wanna come there. So I, I think if we can lead the, the charge the way Jim is leading the charge in all of these ways, that that's, that's how we, we get uh, to where we wanna go as an institution and that's how we get the students to come to us. Uh, one last statement I'd like to make, uh, as my mentor, Winston Marsalis, always tells me, every artist, every person, every business, every performing arts institution must have a very clear, defined, and concise point of entry. And I think that's something that we're doing. And I think if we allow the world to see what we're doing in a greater way, for example, perhaps this panel, even though it is for the family, for our community, this could be a good model, could be a good uh, example, uh, quintessentially to show people how maybe they can have these types of talks. Again, thank you to the administration, to the faculty for being on. Thank you for the students that are on. Uh, and then also, it's interesting that uh, President Gandry decided to choose the music of African-American and African uh, diasporic uh, creators because this year happens to be the centennial of the Harlem Renaissance, 1920, 2020. So there are a lot of resources that are going on, uh, a lot of events that are going on rather in Harlem and around the world to celebrate and uh, talk about a lot of these uh, composers that have uh, people have tried to erase, as Kelly said, out of uh, the history, uh, whether it's Broadway, whether it's jazz, whether it's classical, whether it is uh, you know, just education or art literature period. So I think this is a great time uh, and we can pull in these resources and I think the world would really gain a lot from what we're doing here. Thank you so much. I am going to use the final minutes to just call conclusion to this panel discussion. I first want to say that um, while our time has gone quickly and it may feel like um, given some of the more recent events that your opportunity to engage and participate in this discussion is new for you, perhaps as a member of the MSM community or as an alum or someone who is a supporter of the arts and participating with us today. 
one of the things that I've been so humbled and grateful for since I arrived in July of 2018 is that this was a conversation about inclusion that has been part of the fabric of MSM since my arrival. But in the light of current events, this has been accelerated. It's come from a strategic plan, both in MSM's own interrogation of its work, its opportunities to create more inclusive practices from our community of faculty, staff, students, performance, and curriculum. It is an ongoing journey and one that we are committed to. Um, and we appreciate everyone for being here today. There were over 100 people on this panel um, discussion. And I want to thank those who have been working tirelessly behind the scenes to launch our series, MSM Perspectives. A big shout out to Chris Shade, David Marsh, Michelle Wright, and Monica Christensen, as well as Mimi Tompkins, for putting all of this together from the technology to the advertising to the ideas that you've generated for topics and panelists to be with us. I also want to extend my sincere thanks to our panelists, Liza Gennaro, Kelly Hall Tompkins, Damian Sneed, and Anthony Roth Costanza for such an enlightening conversation. We're all here listening, learning, and taking action to do our part in making a better world. Thank you very much.